Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com. And once again, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems and also one of the authors of Open MPI. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. Here we are in December, the traditional downtime for uh, HPC since we're all recovering from uh, Thanksgiving and supercomputing and whatnot. Yeah, the follow-up to SC and all the holidays and family stuff starts coming in and things just kind of mm-hmm. slow down a lot. Slow down. So, you know, there may or may not be another RC cast at the end of this month. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll um, see if we can squeeze in But you started something new here in December, didn't you? Uh, yeah, actually, I started it at um, SC. It's something I said I was going to do, and I quickly just threw it up. But you'll find on the RCE website a link not only to Jeff's blog, but also... Brock now has a blog. Um, and Brock I, talks I, about himself in the third person on this blog, too. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's just jump right into this then. Brock, I know, uh, I believe you've known our guest here for a couple of years now, right? Yeah, yeah. So this podcast is more going to be a follow up because a previous podcast we had, which was RCE 37 about TerraGrid. Um, TerraGrid recently went away and is now followed on by something called Exceed, and there's been some changes. So I have on someone I have worked with through TerraGrid and now Exceed for a few years now. I have Phil Blood from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So, Phil, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Brock and Jeff. Thanks for having me on your program. Uh, So, um, and uh, I'm uh, also uh, have listened to your podcast and uh, appreciate the work you're doing here. So I'm excited to be here. So, um, yeah, so I work at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and I have for the last, coming up on five years now, uh, my background is in uh, biomolecular simulation. Uh, my PhD was at the University of Utah um, with uh, Greg Voth, who's now at the University of Chicago. And uh, and uh, so I looked at really large-scale biomolecular um assemblies, membranes, and proteins, and, and things, and, and uh, basically was a user of these big national systems, and, uh, and enjoyed working in that realm so much, you know, as much as, as I did working in the science area, so, um, so eventually, so I, so I, I joined up with the, the PSC, and now I work um, as a, a scientific consultant and uh, researcher um, with different research groups across the country, trying to help them use uh, the uh, facilities at these national resources uh, to uh, uh, the greatest extent possible to maximize the return on on their time and investment and, and research. So, um, I, I'm also have become part of you know beyond PSC, you know, also um, Exceed as 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 Brock mentioned, and, and working in various areas there um, in outreach and education. Um, and uh, and also in, in in some training and also um, through extended uh, uh, collaborative support with uh, researchers uh, in that uh, um, uh, from from an exceed standpoint also so um, so that's basically that's a short uh, uh, intro to what I do. So that's interesting that you were working on your PhD was looking for resources found these resources and. You know, the organization never really lets you go. The interesting thing about that is that's kind of how I got started in this field, too. I had an opportunity when I was in school, uh, went into it, found I liked it, and never actually left. So, yeah. Same so thing what... happened to me with MPI, actually. Oh, really? <laughs> my first MPI forum meeting in 94, and uh, wow, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember, back, back. I remember my advisor asking me when I started, you know, are you more interested in science or computation? And at that point, I, you know, I was, I, I said, computation, and and he he happened to have a grid, grid. He ever, he said, you ever heard of something called grid computing? <laughs> and there was a project there to, uh, to to do some work uh, in the group uh, related to grid computing. Is that it, it was sort of the idea of uh, the the folding at home and and boink, uh, that, uh, that that we were looking at at the time. But uh, yeah, I got really excited about these things and. And I knew I wanted whatever I ended up doing in science, uh, which I also found very interesting. I, I knew I wanted to do it through computing, and so that's 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 what drew me into to at the time it was TerraGrid, as you said, and I and I uh, I looked at that and, and said, wow, that looks really cool. And I, I never would have imagined at the time I would have ended up being uh, actually you know 
working in in uh, being a part of TerraGrid and then you know continuing on uh, to uh, to the next generation of this national uh, cyber infrastructure. So um, so it's, it's something I enjoy doing uh, a lot. So, so you used a key word there, cyber infrastructure. From a researcher's point of view and from being a support person at a university that consumed uh, TerraGrid resources, what exactly happened to TerraGrid? It seemed like it was, it was infrastructure. Why did it go away? <laughs> well, it, it all has to do with um, NSF funding cycles. And uh, TerraGrid was uh, funded in several cycles um, in the previous decade, um, I was just reviewing the the history of that, and and um, it started out as there was a solicitation for uh, distributed what the solicitation described as a so distributed terascale facility, and initial award was made to San Diego and um, and Chicago and Caltech and I'm I'm probably forgetting one um, and NCSA uh, to to create this distributed terascale facility, and they called it. Their proposal, they called it TerraGrid, and so that's that's how TerraGrid was born. And and then the funding for TerraGrid was extended into several TerraGrid Phase Two, and uh, the Pittsburgh Super Supercomputing Center actually joined at that point as as a part of the extended TerraScale facility, as was the, what the solicitation called it. And they put down a big resource at that time. I think it was Lemieux, um, and. Uh, and 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 that was and then there was additional funding that that funded TerraGrid through um, 2010 or so and then then uh, the 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 NSF put out another solicitation they called this one X XD which stood for Extreme Digital is uh, was what they were looking for and taking it to this next generation of advanced what they call advanced digital resources um, and uh, sort of moving beyond just thinking of it as um, you know these these big universities. Um, or big uh, centers with with big iron um, into a more inclusive um, sort of digital solution for advancing science, and uh, so that's why I called it Extreme Digital. And the the winning proposal uh, for uh, in response to that solicitation was called Exceed, which stands for, if I can get this right, well, I'll be impressed. Um, Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. So, so that's so that's sort of how that evolved in a nutshell. Okay, so what's different about Exceed versus TerraGrid? So you talked a little bit about the evolution here, but you know, concretely, what what does that mean? What what was different between these programs? Well, so the first the first uh, answer to that, I guess, is that we try to we're trying to keep everything that was good about TerraGrid and leave it alone, <laughs> um, and. Or, or at least to the, I guess the mantra is do no harm. So, so a lot of the things there are actually um, you know very similar. Um, one of the best things that was so so you know the 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 partners uh, a lot of the partners are similar although there's been some some shifting around. Um, the resources right now in terms of the main computational resources um, are are quite similar, but basically the same that we had as TerraGrid ended. Um, and um, so, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are similar, and, and we can talk more about uh, you know some of the, the things that's similar and different. But uh, that that main difference I think that we're uh, moving towards and exceed is making things more um, inclusive of all the different ways that people compute. So in so one way to illustrate that is in in TerraGrid we had what we called resource providers and the focus was on sort of the resource and what resource do you have to contribute so and that would basically be a machine right that they're contributing cycles and of course there were people there contributing expertise too uh, but now in in Exceed we have the idea of a service provider and the service provider may not even have a machine to contribute um, if you look on on the website you can see the list of all the people who are service providers and uh, one of them is actually ULIC Supercomputing Center in, in Germany. And they're not certainly providing a machine to Terragrid, but they're providing, or to Exceed, so you're going to catch me on that. But they are providing services, expertise that uh, we're, we are providing to um, users. No, no, what does that mean? Does that mean I can call them up for help or they help write code? Or what, what does it mean to provide expertise? Uh, so that's, that's a good question. Um, so... So you won't call them up or, or write to them directly necessarily. Um, we have a set, so like we did in Terragrid, we have centralized support mechanisms. And uh, one of the things that 
is also the same in, in XC as was in Terragrid, although we're, we're doing, there are some differences that we can talk about, um, is one of the best things people noted about Terragrid was in-depth support from, from uh, people who are, who are familiar with their science domain, but also familiar with the computing. And we call this advanced support in, in Terragrid, and now we call this extended collaborative support um, in XC just to it, it better, def it's, it's really in, in, uh, whether or not it's a, this type of support is, is really defined by how much, you know, what length of time is it going to take to, to work on a particular project. So, so yeah, so we can bring in experts from wherever they are. So we could have someone from, I think, if I don't, uh, I'm not sure if there's any inter international limitations here, but there is, there are, there is a facility in Exceed to call upon people who are not necessarily paid by Exceed um, to to come in and provide expertise. Um, and but we do this through a centralized mechanism. And so you know you would you would you would apply for this kind of support through a central mechanism. And then the managers and 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 people within Exceed will look for the people with the best background to help you with a particular problem. And and Exceed is serving as a fabric to bring together all these different resources both in people and in in compute resources to um, to address problems and help people solve problems in science so now what do you get uh, you know what does ulic get for example to to be a service provider like that do they get allocations on other people's machines is it kind of a quid pro quo kind of thing or how what what, what is the you know the the re return on investment for providing resources like that so so now you're stepping a little bit outside of, uh, of my direct knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the terms of those agreements. And, and, and this, is, this is probably a good time to point out also that um, Exceed is, is very much right now um, a work in progress. And a lot of these things are being defined. Um, hmm. I've, I've heard uh, some discussion of, you know, what, what is it, what, what, as we start to step into these different realms of service providers, for example, what... You know, how, how do you define exactly, you know, the, the, those relationships? Um, and uh, they've talked about, you know, there's some dis internal discussion going on of how to, how to, um, how to establish, you know, a, a, a structure, you know, um, within Exceed for all these different uh, service providers. So, so these questions are, are not necessarily all um, answered this time, although, um, the, so, so the terms of these specific agreements um, with so there's there, there's a core set of providers there's a core set of of uh, of uh, centers that have PIs on this grant with Exceed and and the lion's share of the actual funding um, goes there. But as I said, there is there is funding available to reach outside of the key Exceed partners, and so a service provider might have um, uh, you know there might be people there that. You know, are are being paid through Exceed through some mechanism, um, and 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 so so we have the means of reaching out with the funding available to Exceed to pay um, people at, at other service providers that come in, or even they might not even be a, a service provider, uh, and uh, you know just individuals at institutions. But maybe as maybe by virtue of being paid, now I'm speculating, <laughs> but uh, someone might become a, ver a service provider because they have some expertise that that we need to leverage. And exceed that that you know the, some of the funding could go towards. So, um, so I'm not sure of the, the the details of that, and I think some of those details may still be being worked out. But um, uh, but that is that is one potential uh, return on investment that that uh, that that uh, is uh, that can that can be um, given uh, to someone who'd be interested in being a, a service provider. So uh, you said you wanted to keep a lot of the good. So for I actually tell a lot of our users who are TerraGrid users who are now Exceed that if you were just using resources that were there before, just approach it as though nothing changed. Am I am I uh, okay telling them that? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so so I, so that is that is our intent. <laughs> um, that that uh, people should be able to use it. As if nothing has changed. Now there are some of the interfaces are evolving. So, so some of the specifics of the interfaces that there's a a portal that uh, you know there's a, that there was there used to be a portal that was portal.terragrid.org, right? 
Terrigrid portal, which is now portal.exceed.org. So there's some of these interface changes that are that are happening, but the basic functionality um, should remain, and we shouldn't by changing something we shouldn't make it more difficult for you to do what you were doing before. If that does happen, then you should yell. <laughs> and there's there's actually a couple of ways to yell. Um, you uh, can email help at exceed.org if something's broken. So that's sort of, you know, if something's broken or not working right, help at exceed.org is, is the place where you, you really, anything you can send there and, and it'll get direct to the right place. If, if you find that a change was made that just makes it harder, your life harder is not as good, or you have some feedback that you want to give. It's not necessarily broken, but, but you ha maybe have some suggestions for making it better. There's another uh, mechanism that, that's been set up as part of Exceed, which we didn't have in Terragrid, which is feedback at exceed.org. And that actually um, brings us right into one of the, the main, one of the main differences between Exceed and Terragrid is that in Exceed, there is a formal mechanism for taking in requirements from users and cranking that through a process and generating, ultimately, the architecture that we put down. And uh, so, so, so Exceed is meant to be flexible and responsive to user requirements and changing user requirements. And there's a formal process for doing that in Exceed. So why don't we step for a moment, and for those of who haven't listened to the TerraGrid podcast, what exactly are the kind of resources, what's the primary resources someone may be interested in when um, approaching Exceed and that Exceed can provide, and what's some of the lesser-known resources that uh, Exceed can provide? So we have a number of different... So I guess you can divide the resources up into you know, your, your main compute resources, uh, your data resources, visualization resources, and then, and then sort of special resources, and uh, those may fall into the compute category, but they're you know they're special for some reason. So, uh, in terms of compute resources, we have kind of two types. We have the we have the high end, very high scale, very tightly coupled, you know what you call MPP or you know massively parallel um, systems, and those right now are the pri primary ones are at um, te at Texas um, and at um, Nix. So so Kraken has 100,000 cores, uh, it's a Cray XT5, and uh, at Nix and then at uh, TAC there's a 65,000 core um, Sun constellation uh, cluster, and so those are the two big high end massively parallel systems on Exceed right now. And then you have a number of, of smaller uh, systems that you might that are usually you know in a fin band connected, so they still have very good scaling performance, but not necessarily to tens of thousands of cores like on the other two systems, but more of the thousand you know or or less type uh, uh, systems. So there's a number of those um, uh, spread out uh, at uh, at different sites. Um, there's another one at, at called Lone Star Texas, and um, uh, and then we. We have also, and, and there's a new resource. Um, well, I, the, 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 so there's a resource called Trestles at San Diego, um, which is actually special because uh, um, it's it's meant to be high availability. So there's some some ways to cut in and and uh, uh, get jobs done that need to be done urgently. It's not allocated at 100 percent, so that so that they can accommodate those kind of things. Um, and, and then we have uh, shared memory systems, and, and the biggest one uh, that uh, we have on Terragrid, and actually it's the biggest shared memory system in the world right now, is Blacklight. It's an Altix UV system uh, with 4,000 cores and, and two segments of 16 terabytes of shared memory. Um, so, so we have the shared memory systems, and, and then uh, we do have um, data allocations uh, that you can get on XC, both for archival and for sort of a wide area file system. Uh, that, that would be usable from different sites across Exceed. We have uh, um, a GPU cluster at NCSA called Forge. Um, we have data intensive machines that are coming on board at San Diego um, uh, called Gordon, and, and there's a precursor to it called Dash. So, so there's a lot of, lot of variety in the system. Then there's, like I said, there's some visualization systems uh, at, uh, at Texas and also at, uh, at, at Nix. So, so quite, quite a, a large variety of 
of systems. And I can go into detail on any one of those that, that you want me to talk about. So what about resources in terms of people? Uh, you mentioned how there's some resource providers that provide things besides uh, actual compute hardware. What, what if I'm trying to scale up to one of these massive things? Like I've, I've got some really neat science, but I just don't have the computational expertise to take it up to the scale that would be required. Right. So, so you can, so, so we have a, an allocation system and within the same allocation system where you would, so you go online and you request the physical, the, the, computational resources or data resources. Uh, in that same system, you can request extended support for, for your application. If you, if you know this is not a basic problem, uh, or even if you're wondering if, if you might need support, uh, you know, extended support, um, you, you go into the allocation system, and right now there's a series of five questions and that describe your need, where you describe your need for um, advanced uh, support or extended support, and that goes to uh, to the exceed management. They look at it. Goes, it's also peer reviewed, so peer, peer reviewers give a recommendation on it. Um, and we we come back and talk to you about your needs, and we try to match up people on exceed who have expertise that can help you solve your problem. Back on TerraGrid, we already had something called advanced user support. Uh, what exactly is extended user support in exceed, and how is it different? In, in exceed, we've taken. We've, we've kept the good things that we had in Terragrid. Um, the, the, the basic model in, in Terragrid was you would work, the, the advanced support was a, a re, an individual research team would, would you know, come and ask for help on a specific problem, as, as we talked about, and, and then we'd find the right people to help them with that, with that problem. And, and you could work with a person for up to a year at a time. Uh, a certain percentage of their time would be dedicated to, to working with this group. So you can do some substantial work. Um, and uh, so that we called advanced support for research teams. Um, and we also had uh, uh, advanced support for, for gateways. So people want to create a, a portal to, to use Exceed resource or territory resources in the background um, uh, uh, or sorry, on the back end. So you have a web interface that helps scientists get their work done. We still have that in, in Exceed. Um, one of the, the, the new things that we have in Exceed is uh, we've expanded that idea of helping communities to we have a, a advanced support or extended support for community codes. So if there's community codes that a lot of people can benefit from, we're, we have a team that's dedicated to identifying those and, and helping to harden and, and help develop codes that a broad range of researchers can, can, can uh, benefit from. And, uh, and then the other thing that's uh, um, new is that we have a 25% of, of, the, of the advanced support time or extended support uh, funding and exceed is dedicated just to seeking out um, areas or researchers and and science domains that haven't traditionally come to use these national these national resources, but that but now have a need for it. So we're reaching out to people in economics, in humanities. Um, that we've, there's a big data explosion in in genomics and bioinformatics um, that that maybe you know we can help with now. And so we have a lot of resources now just to reach out and build communities that have, have not traditionally been built around um, the, this national uh, cyber infrastructure community and help them to learn how to and and help them or allow them to teach us, you know, what what they need um, in order to be to advance their research um, using these systems. So what about in the future? So TerraGrid kind of added resources on over time and older resources fell off the back of the truck and Exceed took over allocating these resources. Why? Uh, what's coming in the future? So, there was a uh, there was a new system announced recently that was won by the Texas Advanced Computing Center (TAC), and this new system is going to call a Stampede. And I don't know a lot of details about it off the top of my head, but it's going to be big. It's going to use um, uh, Intel's new processor, the many integrated cores, MIC um, architecture. And uh, so, so that's coming. I understand that NSF will also be uh, putting out a solicitation for another big resource. Um, and so that is, that is in the works. And those are the two really big solicitations 
um, that, that I'm aware of that are one that was just one and is going to be in the works and the other that is going to be coming the next year or so, I believe the solicitation. So, so Stampede at TAC um, should be coming online in 2013. And, um, and then there'll be another solicitation. I guess that one will come on, you know, for 2014 or through 2015. So you talked a little bit about systems here. What about the other side of it that's becoming a big deal these days? Um, storage. How is storage managed on XSEED? Is that all managed locally at each computational site? Like TAC has their own storage, and if you want to run on TAC resources, you got to get your data down to their storage and then run and things like that? Or what, what is the model? So, yes, the, the, the default model is exactly what you said, that when you get a compute allocation on, on one of these systems, then you have their local storage at your disposal. And usually that's you know some big parallel file system where you actually do all the, the data intensive stuff coming off your computation. And they have usually some archival resource, although not every not every site necessarily has an archival resource. So that, that varies a little bit. Um, but there are also some resources that extend beyond the boundaries of the individual service providers. And currently, the one that is allocatable is a, file, a wide area luster file system called Albedo. And that's not necessarily exceed wide right now. This is, this is something sort of in the works. But, um, but it is available. And if, if sites you know, have interest in, in mounting this, then they can mount it and um, users can use this file system across different exceed resources. Uh, I see. So also, it, it's a multi-organization parallel global file system using all kinds of buzzwords there. Right, right. It's a parallel. It's not not necessarily global because it's not all the way across exceed, but it is it is wide area across organizations. And okay. there is a global. Is, is the intent to someday be global, or is it still just you know a decision per site? Uh, I think the intent is that. So, so right now the intent is there's two different kinds of file systems that would go across boundaries. One would be this this relatively high performance uh, uh, luster file system that would that would span different sites. And I think the intent is that eventually you would have one that would that would cross most of all or most of the main you know resource providing sites. And then there's also a Something that's in the work right now that has to do with another thing that's different about Exceed, which is a push to bridge to local campus resources, and that is a what we call the global federated file system, and that is something that anyone, even people outside of Exceed, you know, any campus could deploy on their site and be able to integrate their file systems with Exceed uh, file systems. And that would not be as high performance as as you know the Luster solution. It wouldn't be intended for high performance, but it would be but it would be truly global. That's fascinating. I, I you know I think we could talk about that for an hour. Um, so yeah. let me let me yeah. not go off in that direction, even though I really want to, because I think there's some really fascinating things to to talk about there. Um, so let me ask a slightly different question: How do researchers move their data on and off? exceed storage is it this federated thing is that what people typically do today or are there some other standardized mechanisms to get my data to random exceed organizations local storage okay so so the standard mechanisms are very similar to what existed in teragrid uh the thing i just said the global federated file system that's one of those things that is in the works in exceed okay <laughs> so there's actually a pilot sites right now that that are in the process of being identified that are going to try that out. And, and we hope to make that standard, you know, in the future. And, then, and that would be one way to get your files on Exceed when that, when that is put into production. Um, the, 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 the basic mechanisms are, um, so in general, um, you, would, you would do very basic things, you know, to get it to, uh, onto Exceed. That uh, a lot of researchers find, you know, SCP is going to work great. And um, so, so that's one way to do it. Um, there is a new data transfer service that's coming, that's, be, that's in being integrated into Exceed called Globus Online. And uh, that is uh, a more sort of a GUI mechanism and also has some nice trans, uh, a lot of nice characteristics for managing data transfers 
and optimizing data transfers that you can use from your laptop um, and with a GUI interface. And uh, the Globus Online folks actually handle the data transfer. So, um, so you can establish different endpoints, and, and Exceed has endpoints, and Terrigrid has endpoints. Well, Terrigrid had endpoints, and Exceed now has endpoints, and you, and uh, you know other campuses have endpoints, and, and you can establish endpoints at your campus and on your laptop and you know wherever you want, and use that to transfer data. So that's another mechanism, um, and and uh, and there's also something called Grid FTP that uh, if uh, if you're really into you know high performance transfers, Globus Online uses Grid FTP under the hood, or you can use it explicitly um, on your on your campus. So th th those those are a few ways, and there's probably others that that I could go into. Yeah, the Globus Online stuff's neat. Uh, we actually set up UMich endpoints for our local resources here. And so it makes actually moving back and forth between Exceed and uh, our local resources really easy. And actually, I'm trying to get those guys on this show. So if you know anybody over there, please let me know. Sure, yeah, we can, we can do that. And, that, and that, that integration is ongoing. So it'll become even easier in the future to use Globus Online with Exceed. That's, that's you know, currently in the process of being fully integrated. But it's pretty easy even now. Uh, to, to use it. I've used it and, and uh, we re recently used it. Uh, we set up an, an access point for some researchers who are doing some genomics application. They wanted to, us to host some data for them and, and uh, we, we set up a Globus Online point where researchers could, could pull down data from Exceed. So it's kind of like a, it was a special instance, but it's something you can do. I mean, if you ask for things, then we try to do our best to get it to you. I mean, we try to be flexible and help the community with what they need. So we created a, a uh, just we put we had, we put aside some storage for this, and we and we created a special server. We put a Globus Online endpoint and FTP, you know, endpoint, and, and researchers could get at the data different ways. So, so we are we are trying to do things to host data also and, and distribute to to communities that that need it that can take advantage of it. So, keeping with this data line, uh, does Exceed have any facilities for dealing with HIPAA or privacy sensitive data? No. Is the short answer. <laughs> um, so I think the the official policy is that researchers should know their the the this the security restrictions of, of their data, and they they're responsible for it. And uh, if they have restrictions, then they should make sure that that what we offer and exceed um, is compliant with with what they. With, with what they've agreed to do in terms of keeping their data secure. So, so pretty much the onus is, is now, now we certainly take, we certainly have security mechanisms in place and exceed in terms of uh, the, you know, just not letting bad guys get at data, cybersecurity and, and all that. There's a lot of effort in that. Uh, but as far as regulations like HIPAA, um, it's, it's up to the research to make sure that, that they're allowed to put their data, you know, in different places on exceed. So let me use that to spin off in a slightly different direction. Say I'm a random researcher at some non-Exceed affiliated university. How do I how do I get involved in Exceed? You know, I've got some science I want to run, and I don't have resources to do it. How do I how do I get an allocation? Uh, so the basic mechanism is um, the the portal is kind of the one stop shopping spot for for everything you do in Exceed, um, and so. So you get an account on the portal, and anyone can do that without you just. It's just like you get an account, um, you know, where, you know, on any online service. You create a username, you create a password, you verify that you're a human, and uh, and and then you've got an Exceed portal username, and and then within that portal, you can then go in um, to uh, to the allocation site, and um, you can look at the different in the portal. You can look at the different resources that are available. Uh, the portal also has a place to uh, look at what software is available currently, although we can pretty much install anything you want um, as long as you have a license or it's free. Um, and, um, and then you can look in and decide you know, what, what resources you, you need. Um, if, and then you, know, you, you, submit a, you submit a, to get started is really easy. You, you, you submit your information, uh, you pick some, some resources you want to use or try out, um, you Upload a CV and you write a paragraph saying why you want to try these these resources and um, and that's basically a rubber stamp kind of process and we just try to direct people to the right resources when we get those kind of requests. And so, now, does so this you, involve? Do I have to pay for these kinds of things? Do I get need to give a credit card number 
or is this all researchy credit kinds of things? I mean, like if you've never even heard of my, you know, I'm from the University of Nowhere, right? Um, right. How do you authenticate and, and regulate who gets on these systems? So uh, there, there's no, for, for academic nonprofit researchers, uh, there's no, there's never any money that exchanges hands. So, so it's, it's all free of charge. It's a service provided through the National Science Foundation. You, you do have to have an investigator, or you have to have staff at, at an academic nonprofit university in the United States, or institution in the United States, to, to be the PI. But if you're a foreign collaborator of that person, you can get an account. Okay, so that's that's one thing is that that the PI does have to be at a U.S. institution. Um, but but there's yeah there's no payments. Uh, it, it, the way it's controlled is through peer review. So and 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 then the centers have a say on on how much you know they actually can allocate. So the constraints of the system and peer review are the way that we we decide how how much we allocate to to each person. Um, but the startup that I just described is is pretty much available to everyone. We'll we'll pretty much give anyone a startup to try things out. Um, and you can get up to 200,000 core hours through a startup. So it's actually not not insubstantial amount of time uh, you can get through that startup. And then you can try things out. And based on what you do there, you could actually submit a research proposal where that would be peer-reviewed um, and, and allocated based on input from reviewers and from the different centers. Hmm, cool. All right. So you mentioned, uh, again, going off in a different direction because it's just my mind bounces around. I apologize. You mentioned a couple things throughout uh, the questions here about some upcoming initiatives and upcoming hardware and things like that. Give us one more thing that's coming on in the future that you guys are actively working on now, because one of the themes that I've heard through what you've been saying is it's what's fascinating about this project is that you're not pretending to have all the answers right now and you're actively trying to figure out what is the best way for people to access and to use these things. So give us one more initiative that you guys are working on. Yeah, and, and thanks for coming back to that. When, when I talk about new things coming on, uh, you're absolutely right. The, we're, we're looking at at federating with other providers of, of different things, like resources or expertise, and, and bringing the, being the fabric for tying these things together. So something that is is right in the works right now is, for example, making uh, the Open Science Grid a service provider on Exceed. And... I don't know, I'm not familiar with the intimate details of where that is in the process, but eventually, as I understand it, uh, OSG will be a service provider and people who get an allocation on Exceed can request an allocation on the Open Science Grid, which is, um, for those who don't know, it's, uh, um, it's more, more of a high throughput computing solution. Um, and they do that very well uh, with lots of serial or very small parallel jobs. Uh, that people just need to run a bunch of those. And so, so OSG is going to integrate as a service provider um, in, in Exceed. And you can look forward to other types of, of, of partnerships like that with other service providers coming online um, uh, in, into, into Exceed. Okay, Phil, thanks a lot. Exceed.org and all the information's on there and where to get started and what to find out about. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. And uh, uh, if you have you know if you have questions about these things, we're we're there to help. If you're just getting started, you know, emailing help at exceed.org is a great place to start. If you just want to throw out a random question and and have someone a real person come and talk to you uh, about uh, how to get started. Okay, thanks again. And you can find us online uh, rce at rce castcom uh, Again, I'm Brock Palin. You can find me on Twitter at Brock Palin. And Jeff, uh, what's your contact? I am Jeff Squires at Twitter, and I've got the blog, which is the best way to find me, off rcecast.com. So, Phil, thanks again for your time. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Jeff and Brock.